Hello. Hello, guys. Can you hear me? Please let me know. We'll start this conversation in one minute. Let me know, please, if you can hear me. So, hello, everyone. Welcome online again. Uh, please let me know if the sound is great for you. Uh, and please send me your answer in this chat box. Okay, great, thank you. So, welcome to the second edition of our live streaming, Ask Me Anything About Lean. My name is Luciana Barros, I'm marketing manager of Stoffen in Brazil. This project was launched on July as an international project. And today we are so proud to say that it's becoming a global project. Today, we will receive uh, for this informal talk a very, very special guest, directly from China, the Lean expert, Ken Liu. So today we will, we will have gathered here for this special edition, three Lean experts to talk about Lean, of course. Uh, together with Ken Liu, we have Dario Spinola, Managing Director of Stoffen in Brazil, and our world known Lean coach, Michael Ballet, author of the Lean Strategy and the Goldmine Trilogy. So, first of all, I would like to uh, invite you to send all your questions in the chat box. Uh, this, the purpose of this event is to help you to solve your problems with Lean, of course. So your interactions are really, really important to us. So the last message I have for you today is that this stream is live both in YouTube and LinkedIn. So I would like to invite you to follow our two channels. LinkedIn and YouTube. So uh, we are always uploading great contents for you and you will be, uh, you, you will receive the notifications about these contents. So let's finally start this conversation. I would like to ask Dario Spinola to join us. Dario? Dario has... Hello than 20 years of experience in Lean Consulting in Brazil and China. He is co-founder of, of Tactica Lean Consulting in Brazil. Dario, welcome. Hello, hello everyone. Hello, Luciana. Good morning, good morning for who, who is watching us, is following us in Brazil. Good afternoon for who is in France and Europe. And good evening. Good evening, Ken Liu in China and for everyone listen to us in Asia and China. I know we've got people, at, and attendees in this chat from several countries in Asia, Indonesia, China, and in Europe, in Germany, France, Italy, uh, US, Mexico, South America, so Morocco, even Middle East. So welcome everyone. It's actually this initiative we, um, we started with Michael Ballet as a, a Lean Guru. He's the author of the Lean Manager, uh, the Gold Mine, the Lean Strategy, Lead with Respect. And he's one, one of the persons that I personally um, have uh, learned a lot about Lean. And, and another, another person we have in this uh, life is Ken Liu, also who I uh, met in China several years ago. I think 10 years ago, I, I spent, I had the pleasure for living in China for 10, about 10 years, uh, eight years actually. And Ken Liu 
uh, became one of my, let's say, one of the lean experts who, who I know and who knows a lot. Ken Liu is a general manager of Acme. It's a company located in Shenzhen area in the south of China. And the idea of this live, I'd like uh, Gustavo, please uh, bring our guests, bring, bring here into the live, Michael Ballet, Ken Liu. Hello, Michael. Hello. Hello. Ken. This, so, this is incredible. Uh, we're 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 circling the circling the globe. <laughs> we, have all, we have all time zones. This is really, this is fun. This is fun. This is fun. Exactly. Yes, that's a triangle. Huh? China, France, Chi um, China, France, and Brazil. We started this initiative. I would not. I would not. I wouldn't call it a project. This is more a open initiative at how we can uh, spread lean across across the globe and. To really discuss what really matters, right, Michael? I think that's the the pure the, the, the purpose of the of sharing. And Ken, welcome, welcome on board. I'm very happy uh, to to see you again here on the screen. <laughs> or uh, we we had a lot of good times in China. I know Kim from Marcus Chow, Marcus Chow, and I know Michael Ballet also from Marcus Chow through Marcus Marcus Chow. Who is the, the, the another Lean Guru, the president of Lean Enterprise China? Um, and I think, I think he's, the, he's the godfather of us all. We wouldn't be here without Marcus. Exactly, I wouldn't be here. Exactly. So he's the, the main connection. <laughs> yes. So welcome, guys. Um, as Luciana said, for who is watching us, this is a this is a more a chat. This is more a, a live freestyle, uh, we haven't prepared anything, and the idea is to, uh, that we can talk anything about Lee. That's the whole idea. Um, and please, you can share your questions, thoughts through the chat, so we can see here. Um, we are wondering also to, to listen from you, Ken, so your experience, your point of view. I, as I mentioned, I have some perspective about China, um, after eight years, um, knowing a little bit the, the culture, the, 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 the passion of people, how, how, how really the Chinese learn and, and apply. It's really something unique, I must say. So, and, and everyone can learn from it. Um, usually we start with a few questions. Maybe I can throw one question here, something we received up front. And then from that, from receiving questions through the chat, we start this, uh, we, we go on the conversation. Does it sound good, Michael, Ken? Yeah, it's perfect, it's perfect. Yeah, perfect. excellent. Um, we've got here one question from Quality. This is a uh, quality department. He's a, he's a quality manager. He's, uh, he's mentioned something like, um, what are, it, it's, a, it's a question coming from Spain, by the way, the company in Spain. His question is, what are the responsibilities of the quality department and information system department in an organization? He, he also, that, that's his question. He's making here a quote saying that, in many cases, information system is a sort of data provider and is very disconnected to the flow. And quality many times only control the data about some process, but without any real implication. Well, which is true. And so his question is, what is the responsibility, the real responsibility? What, in a lean perspective, what is the, the, the responsibility of equality department? Michael, what would you say about it? Um, well, it's, it, it, as, I, as always, it depends. It, everything is different. It depends where you start from, but let's think about what we're trying to do in lean. Um, the worst thing that can happen is that defects are, are reach the customer. Then the, so we try to stop them and we stop them by final inspection. And then we try to stop them by line at the end of the line inspection. Then we stop them by worker self inspection. And then we try to do real Jidoka, which is stop them in the machine itself or in the process itself. Right? So the whole lean thing is about moving this curve backwards. <clears throat> we, we want to have less defects of the customer and then less at final inspection. 
and all the way back in terms of the process. Now, the thing is, the big thing about Lean is that the quality department is no longer responsible for all quality because every manager has to be responsible for their own defects because they have the responsibility to respond to the Kanban with only good parts. So, th so they take a part of the work. But we still have all the part dealing with customers that needs to be done and final inspection. So, so what this means is just moving the front of the barrier. We, we have a real need for a quality department that handles um, any problem with customers with complaints and recalls and all this. And we really need customer support. We really need customer service. We really need quality involved there. And we really need quality to explain um, to managers what what quality is, because when you're a manager, it's Ken. I'm sure you agree. It's it's not always easy to understand what customers value as quality is for. So so we have less need of process of control quality. We have a lot more need of understanding uh, quality. Right, right, right. Interesting and. Um, if we take Ken, I, I, I push this back this to you now because um, it is uh, China is feeding the, the world with uh, many products. Good products, high quality, high standards, and also uh, products that are considered well, low quality products and um, made in China products, something like that. How, how do you see this point on quality control? And as, as as Michael said, how how can what's 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 really um, the, the, the point of uh, the quality inside lean from in a Chinese factory? Yeah, let me take an uh, example, example for this uh, story. Uh, like uh, five years ago, uh, quality is very focused on inspection. We have uh, IQC incoming quality check, and IPQC, IPQC, and also the uh, before ship, shipping out, uh, like Michael say, uh, uh, okay. so a lot of people are inspecting the pass. So when we started to implement Lean, we tried the first. Uh, uh, we try to implement the implement the flow. So the flow stops always very frequently because of the quality is not stable. We cannot flow if we have defects. So later, we uh, also reorganize our organizational structure. We organize our, our organization like a horizontal value stream. We have value stream manager, and we have production quality in the, in the same value stream organization. And the quality, they we switch their responsibility from the inspection to help designing the quality in the flow. How we can uh, design the process with the pokeyaki or with the uh, how to say the machining, uh, error proofing, everything to make sure the pass from the material flow to the diecasting, CNC, every process without defects in the process. So the quality become uh, how to say more involved in the manufacturing process uh, design or developing. So. And then we, after a lot of uh, improvements, we eliminate the IPQC, I mean, the, in the process inspection, we use the, uh, how the operator to, to be responsible for the quality of the flow. So later with this quality support, very strong quality support to make the flow possible. Without the quality stable, the flow is a, is a joke. I, I completely agree. I completely agree, Ken. Without without really strong involvement from quality, we can't fix the flow. Absolutely. Yeah, we can see some uh, new cell in the, in the workshop. Uh, you can see the back uh, back on the new cells in the shop. But the the the, the path is not flowing. It's a stop, 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 stop because right, of right. quality defects. But now in Acme, uh, with this. Uh, different organizational uh, structures and also the we call it uh, building quality in, in the flow. Uh, we are possible to make some flows even from diecasting to CNC. Uh, diecasting is very quick. 
a few seconds, right? 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. The ESD process is like uh, uh, two minutes, three minutes. We can make this uh, flow from diecasting to CNC. Not exactly, but partial flow. We pick up two or three parts every hour to the CNC. Uh, once only we set up the CMC, we start the diecasting machine to make sure the pass is, after diecasting is flowing to the CNC, no, uh, with the building quality uh, process. <coughs> process. Mm -hmm. Interesting. There is a, there is a comment from Sokan Jensen. He's mentioning something, go see, ask, understand, and develop colleagues. That's exactly. Um, if, we, if we see, and in our experience in Brazil, Brazil, the tradition, the companies are organized everywhere in the world, actually, but here's very strong department. So engineering department, production department, quality department, so on and so forth, right? I see quality similarly to lean, lean department. Many companies establish lean department. So everyone in the company, in the process, oh, no, lean support, leave that to the lean guys. So they'll come here and help us. The same for quality. Oh, this is, uh, let's wait for quality to inspect and approve, right? The, the, green, the green remark, the green label, they put it here, the green label or the red label, they approve or, or approve a certain lot. I think the ultimate goal of a lean department or quality department is to disappear, is to embed they become some sort of lean promoters, quality promoters. They are not a department, but they are part of the flow, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Ken. So this should become, and, and this is, yeah, Mike. Dario, do, do you remember the, we were together in a factory and I think it, what Ken is saying is very profound because um, we tend to see lean as pillars. You know, there's the Jidoka pillar and the just-in-time pillar, but what Ken is saying is that there's a very strong connection between both do you remember the, the factory we visited that they had done a great progress on quality and then they were stuck. It would not progress anymore. Right. And the, their Japanese sensei kept saying, you need to be more flexible. You need to do more changeovers. And the plant was saying, well, no, because if we do more changeovers, uh, a lot of the quality problems that come at changeovers, so we will regress in terms of quality. And, and it was funny because that was a precise point. The point of understanding the process is that if they did more changeovers, they would have to go deeper in terms of what, what Ken is saying, in terms of the understanding of the process and what makes the quality problems. Right. And so they would, they would reach another level of quality. So it was, do you remember that factory? They were great. I mean, you know, they, they really, I, mean, I remember a wonderful welcome. It was, it was fa fantastic, but uh, it, it's, it's understanding this link between the, not just flow, but also flow. flexibility in the flow right, right, and quality, because absolutely, if you don't have quality, you can't have that. But on the other hand, if you're not trying very hard to flow, and if you're not trying very hard to flow flexibly, you also get stuck on the progress on the quality. quality. Right, right. There is this. That's a triangle, right? You, 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 you look for flow, flexibility. That's why a lot of changeovers. But keep and improve quality. That's, yep. that's uh, true, true. And that's why I like this comment. Uh, go see, understand. Go to the roots. So the people who who, who does the process, people who is really doing and, and making, they're the ones for learning and understanding and making it happen right i, th I think, I think the difficulty with the go and see <laughs> is it's different to say go and see than genshi genbutsu um there is an aggressiveness to genshi genbutsu that you don't have in go and see go and see can be very passive mm -hmm. but no you're, you're going and seeing but in fact you're saying please improve flow please improve flexibility mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you have to push it there's and a purpose. They tell you yeah. it's not possible. This is what we did in the plant. We say, well, it's not possible. What do you mean it's not possible? It's just we haven't found how. So it, it, it's go and see and challenge to, to improve the flow and improve the flexibility for Kaizen and improve the quality. And I think this is, this is what Ken is saying is this will, whether you take it quality first or whether you take it flow first, in any case, you need to, do, you need to walk on both feet. Mm -hmm. You can't walk on one foot. I think it's great. Right, right. There's a question coming and related, it's related to this topic of quality and talks, of, talks about standard work. And let's, let us make a connection with that. 
Let's say a, there's a question coming from a guy working in a pharmaceutical company, uh, which is that is fairly early on its lean journey, and they're struggling to properly execute standard work. Part of the challenge challenge is they treat it as work st uh, work instructions or SOPs, standard operating procedures. Because this is highly regulated industry, pharmaceutical, right? They want to put the standard worksheets in their systems as they do with SOPs. And every time there is a miss, example, miss, miss of cycle time, uh, and then it generates a lot of paperwork, investigations, and countermeasures. The cause sometimes to push back and threatens and uh, the efforts to create good standard works. I'm trying to teach the organization the difference between work instructions and standard work to properly utilize the two of them and then reach out to the, um, the, the let's say, what's uh, the, the purpose of the, the standard work. So what's, what's our view on the, what's the best way to present the distinguish, the difference between work instructions and standard work? Michael, what would you, would you say about this? I, I think we have to from the top. From the top. Um, um, Ooh, got an echo. The, uh, our companies, particularly large companies, are built on two ideas. W w management right now is, is, is some kind of super tailorism. It's a tailorism applied to everywhere. So they're by, built on two ideas. First, they're built on functional specialization. So whenever you have a problem, you create a specialist unit, and then you create a hierarchy, and you drive this and you specialize and specialize and specialize. And then it's built on process standardization. Those are the two main ideas. So whenever you have a new executive, all they want to do is that they want to strengthen the specialized hierarchy, more reporting, da, da, da. And then they want to standardize the process more. And they think standardized work is great because this is a way to standardize the process more. But in Lean, we're looking at a third idea, which is how to coordinate learning. How do we learn? So <clears throat> standardized work is a learning thing. It's a learning tool. It's like, here is the ideal way the work should be done. Let's look at every time we don't do it this way and understand why and solve the problems. It's not a policy you apply. It's, a, it's a, just a tool to discover your problems. But that is very difficult to explain if what the management thinks is that we should standardize the process. Now, standardizing the process is a good idea if every case is the same. But if every case is not the same, what you're doing is standardizing one case. And then it's a disaster. So we really need to explain to senior management the standard work is about is a tool to learn. It's to compare with an ideal and understand why we fall short of the ideal and not a way to standardize the process. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Ken. Yeah, in China, sometimes it's more difficult because in many companies or factories, like uh, you, you, you uh, stay in China for many years, all the uh, work instructions or the SOP are only the documents in the workshop. Nobody take a look at them. It's just the documents for the ISO audit and everything. So like see, like work instructions, it's kind of uh, the top management or the managers to instruct how the operator to do the job. But actually the operators, they know much better than the managers so they know much better than the managers so, so that that means the instructions from the managers and the new engineers is worse than the way operators are doing so uh if we want to instruct the operators how to do the job it doesn't work it should come from like uh, michael says it should come from working together the team leaders and the operators they do it together to find a uh, find a better way and then document it that's the standards work. But then the operator will uh, change different opinion about this document. Okay, this is, this is the way 
I'm, I, I develop and I'm doing. So uh, that's kind of the instructions and uh, standard that's work developed by the team yeah, yeah, this, this is brilliant. I mean, you know, 25 years doing lean, I've never thought of this. This is work instructions. This is about instructing people. We think of work instructions like here's the piece of paper. I don't need a person. I take away the person. You take, we think instructions are directions, but you're absolutely right. Work instructions, it's about instructing people how to do the work. Oh, this is, right. No, this is great. Yeah, you're absolutely yeah, right. Yeah. One, one, one perspective that I'll, I'll put that way is uh, or if we connect, if we see work instructions or SOPs, as you mentioned, standard operating procedures, more the technical side of the instructions. So something related to the product itself, uh, how to put the, make the right connections or assemblies, so on and so forth, more on the engineering side. Standard work is how we, how we do it, how we connect it in, within the environment, within the boundaries of a cell or a line, what are my routines? So, and then uh, I would say the work instructions is to instruct people how to do properly, technically speaking. And standard work, and there is, I think this is also a misunderstanding, is not only, is not for the operator uh, itself or him or herself, because they, they learn it very fast, but it's more for the leadership. How no, the team no, leader, how the no, supervisor no. is re really not, not looking, I don't have on a paper, but in Rio, this is happening there in the shop floor. I, I, I remember Sensei, you know, when I was learning uh, the distinction you're making, standardized work and standard work. So we have standard work in terms of here are the difficult points we need to for quality. And standardized work is about how do we keep to tag them? How do we keep productivity? Yeah. So I was there on the shop floor looking at the paper, looking at the operator, looking at the paper trying to follow the cycle, you know, it's like, and, and the sensei say, ah, stop that, stop that, stop looking at the paper and say, what do you mean? Stop looking at the paper. Say, look operator, say, look eyes, look hands, look feet. And I was what? And, and say, look eyes. So I, okay. So I look at the operators and I look at their eyes and, and suddenly I see, yeah, here they're, Focusing, there's crunching up. They mean there's something difficult to do in the work. And then he says, "Look hands," and say, "What do you mean, look hands?" And and then then you know the the idea of the strike zone. One hand, two hands. Where are the hands going? And then say, "Look feet," and and you know suddenly you realize that this is right. not a regular pattern. You know why is he going over there? Why is he going there? And to me that was the the strongest uh, sensei lesson on what standardized work really is, which is understanding everything the operator is struggling with. Uh, you, you want a smooth and seamless work. So you understand everything this operator is struggling with and you use the paper to agree on the problem. So you, you use the paper after, right. say, okay, here at this point, you have a struggle here at this point, you, you diff it's difficult. Or to, or, or to even fix the standard, right? If you yeah, find- Maybe, but usually it's the standard is, is fine. Sometimes you fix the standard when you improve something, but, but to get there, you know, it's first you use the standard to identify where, where, where it's difficult for the operator. And, and that, that, was a, that, was a, that was a fun lesson. And this answering a question, this might be a good way of teaching how to get the organization to really understand uh, this standard work, standardized work, to really how to see how to see the operations, to see the operators uh, doing doing the work, right? Stepping movement. I think, I think, I think we the, the difficulty we're here is that it's back to what Ken said about instruction. Instruction is about teaching and learning, if we use it that way. So the difficulty we have with our organizations is that if we don't break away from super Taylorism, from this idea that once the process is standardized, everybody is like a robot and then we can replace them by robots. You know, if we don't break, if the organization doesn't understand the need for work instruction, as Ken says, and if we can't convince the management of the need of instructing, and in order to instruct, you have to learn because they know more than you do. So, 
uh, I, th I think it's very hard to answer the question and to go anywhere because because the leadership will never understand what you're trying to do and they will always go back to just write the instructions and get them to do it excellent Ken? yeah okay so one one question coming from daniel braston um referring to one of your posts michael he's asking michael you posted about the dangers of automation and the impact on learning uh, on employees and on the organization. Can you expand, please? I I don't again I, I don't have, I don't I don't think automation is all right. Automation is great as long as you understand that it's to make the employee's life easier. So we automate dangerous tasks difficult tasks boring tasks it's great but it's not an end in itself you know um how to present it back to quality quality of the product quality is a human feeling um do you see the feeling of a of a, a car door when it shuts well it makes this sound and feeling it feels that it shuts clap you know it's nice you know it's a human feeling and when you build the quality in the product at every stage the best way is still the human touch it's a human feeling quality is not just a process number it's a human feeling so the only way to get real quality is to have humans work for humans with humans now of course um, a human can bend a steel bar or, or create a, a steel part or a plastic part. So they need machines. And then the machine needs to be fed and all sorts of movements that a human doesn't have to do. So you can automate all you want. As long as you still see that it's the human person that makes the part. So you can have one operator in a cell that is all automatic machines. And you have the impression that they only push the part around, yes? When you see a, a continuous flow cell. But they don't only push the part around. They are there to make sure the quality is there at every stage. And they are there to stop and respond if something is wrong. They, they are making the part, even though it's all fully automated. So what we tend to do in the West is we tend to want to replace humans by machines and where we can't build the machine because it's too complicated because you need a flexible somebody who can do something flexible you put a person because you can't take them away and i think that is silly because you can't learn but automation is great as long as you have one person using all these machines and then you can learn because this person will always tell you how we can change the machines machines can't learn Machines can't learn, but people can. How to better use the machines. And one thing that is striking, I haven't been to China in, in a long time, which I miss it. But last time I was in Japan, it's striking to see how they have these flow lines because they learn to take these big machines and turn them into smaller single piece machines so we can flow it. The machine will never do that to itself. The operator. Right, will. right. I think that that's a very good point. Uh, when we see it, a dark factory doesn't exist at all, right? A factory without people, it doesn't exist. This is something. But when when we when we see the whole flow, completely the complete flow from raw material to final product, so you can uh, have a certain single uh, needs of a. Of replacing a manual press for a machine that to, rather than I have a cycle time of 10 seconds, I'm gonna have a cycle time of one second to be fast. That, that's a capacity matter. That's not, but in single points of the complete of the flow, this automation can help. But I like what you said, Michael. I think that's the, 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 the big takeaway here on this. We can use automation as long as we are bringing something back to people, if it is a danger operation, if it is something very difficult to do and you can do properly and better with a machine. I think uh, or, making or, this distinguish. Or, or, or if it's boring as hell. 
or boring, yeah, there is no learning. This is very simple and just do it. Just a machine will do it better. But at the end of the day, uh, in, in, in the whole flow, this is managed, this is done by people, right? And for those workstations that sometimes are replaced, okay, I had here 10 people, now I have two people because of I, I have a new machine, all right, these people might be doing something else, more and adding value something somewhere else, right? It's a, it's, it's a sort of a grow, but I like this statement, what you, you mentioned, how to, if we can prioritize to put automation where it's, it really needs on safety issues, difficult or boring, and so on and so forth. Ken, do you have uh, this experience in your factory? So Acme is a metal uh, company, right? So, yeah, can you hear? Can, yes, give me 10 minutes, I'll show you uh, one, one, one small toys in my office. Yeah. Let us see what this small to toy is. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm very intrigued now. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. And oh, oh wow! This is a, a simple a robot with uh, with the, this uh, all the connections and signals. So before we before we go to automation or process in the workshop, I try to teach our engineers in the in the how they use this uh, six six uh, SS robot to. To simulate it, what the process should be in the in the how to say in the workshop, because like many uh, companies in China, they bought they can very easily bought a hundred robots, a hundred ABB robots, and after one year they say, oh, it doesn't work, and then they sell it or whatever, and then some companies bankrupt it because they invest too heavy on the automations. They cannot replace the uh, how to say the hard work, the dangerous work, and everything. So. Uh, it's very dangerous to just to automate it, the process with a lot of waste. So this is my toy in my in my office. Uh, every automation robot, uh, I only invest it if we can simulate it in my office. Uh, this is brilliant. I remember uh, factory every time I did the Gemba's on uh, Gemba walk on the Mondays. I say, what's happened with the robot? They've gone to sleep. They haven't woken up on the Monday. Because every time I was there, the robot was off. And we finally realized what is because, in fact, the robot had to have very, very precise parts to fit them, more precise than the design needed. So, in fact, in order to use the robot and to keep, as opposed to the human operator, and to keep, keep shave a few seconds on the operation, they had to supply the parts in more precision parts than the design needed it because the robot couldn't handle variation. So they not only had added a lot of uh, extra cost to the parts, but they had supply issues. And of course, they still had variation, so the robots will still stop. So I think, I think this is brilliant, Ken. I think this is, this is great. <laughs> it's like, <coughs> please tell me what you're going to do with this robot right. before you put it in. Oh, absolutely. I love it. I love it. Oh, this is and, like, and, yeah. and that's a way of motivating and uh, encouraging and, people. And for... Have you come across Karakuri? Uh, sorry? Karakuri. Have you come across Karakuri? Karakuri? Karakuri. Okay. okay. This is something to it that does. And a friend of mine here, I started a company just doing that. It's um, non, it's a mechanical rope. It's, it's a mechanical support without the hydraulics or the electronics or it's all mechanical it's all done with gravity so oh, okay. it's really very light and start smart automation so it's interesting the robot that you're showing in your office because the next stage is how do we do light robots mm -hmm. and a lot of uh, toyota's flexibility now and um, green process is they're doing very very clever with just tubes and a few captors, and you take all the heavy hydraulics, all the all the energy part out of the robot to have much, much lighter equipment. And the other great thing is that these things can be kaizen by the operators themselves. Mm -hmm. 
because it's like Lego kits, you know, you can assemble them and so forth. So I think, I don't know if you, you might want to look at it, um, look at look it up, it's, it's called Karakuri and it's uh, radically changing how we design plants. And that's also very interesting, Karakuri, for um, encouraging, uh, inspiring, let's say, creativity, right? Not only for having... Uh, oh, no, absolutely. Ice. Because, you know, it's, it's incredible. Now, now that captors are so cheap, uh, it's, it's incredible what you can do with very, very simple you know, um, Much and, 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 and inexpensive capture. And, and it was incredible is that you can get the operators to actually work on it on the line. So mm -hmm. it's, no, it's really, it's, it's very, very fun. Yeah. So very encouraging. Very good, good, good insight. There is an interesting question from Jonathan. He's saying in many kinds of companies, we see that the sectors or departments like production, warehouse, maintenance, logistics, and etc., work in individual system and solve problem. Um, and problem solving is not considered a philosophy of customers first. His question is: How can I do the philosophy? How can I bring this philosophy customer first in a form of bottom up when the culture's company is not there? Um, that, that's a very difficult one. It's a very difficult one because I can't say anything else that it's a CEO's job. That is the number one CEO job. The CEO's job is to be the customer's advocate. Somebody in the company has to represent the customer and it has a CEO because all the functional health in the exec, you know, I work with CEOs and I work with exec executive committees and th these guys in the executive committees, all they care is about their careers. So they care about their function and they have turf wars with all the functions and they care about the next job. So they want to implement the latest technology so it looks good on their CV. They have all these motivations and some sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but who cares? And you can't have a, a representative of the customer so that's that's the number one job of ceo actually when you think about it this way the ceo has to represent all constituencies he's also of course has to represent the shareholder because they usually hold a hold a gun to their heads and say it's like a give dividend or else and you of course represent the workers because it, the function doesn't represent the workers but but the first job of the ceo is to represent the customer. Well, one thing that's uh, again questions. This question comes with a functional department, right? Again, the difficult of seeing a value stream from customer to customer, from raw material to final product. That's a very hard. Uh, 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 let's say uh, that's very difficult for people for for looking at the process like that. And uh, one thing that I learned from you, Michael, ten years ago, I think 2010, 2011 getting people the problems throughout the value stream they exist there are a lot there are even the more difficult problems right rather than the, the the wastes we find within production we see you know some scraps we see transportations here and there within a, let's say production department but the problems across the organization are systemic problems they are like cancers right very difficult one thing that i learned from you getting people to solve problems together Remember that? So oh, the absolutely. best way for, for getting people to learn, to bring the problem-solving culture, is you have here a engineering, let's say, uh, issue with the design, and then it's very hard to, to manufacture in the shop floor. Rather than the shop floor, throw it back to engineering and back and forth, all right? Here we do have our A3, whatsoever you, you want to call it but solve it together. You, you take the, the heads and you bang them together until it's all right. Right, right, right. I think, uh, Jonathan, the, the if uh, bottom-up is uh, getting people to solve together, identify those connection problems, connecting problems, right, that are on the interface across the value stream. Because what we want at the end of the day is to create flow, and flow exists only in the value stream. And problems are there everywhere, right? Um, um, 
that's uh, I would say this is I learned I, I learned from you, well, Mike. When well, I always try to teach this, getting people to solve problems together. Ken and in Akemi, uh, is Akemi uh, still departmental? No, company? They, they have, you said you have value stream management. Value, value stream, stream right? Manager. Yes. Can you share a little bit on that? This might be insightful. Yeah, so we have uh, two value streams. One is green, one is uh, blue. Every value stream has uh, the, from the uh, plant production, quality, engineering, uh, shipping, customer service, even uh, collecting, uh, issuing the invoices. So the uh, value stream manager manage uh, a group of five, around five people, five office people to uh, from pro from the production to to shipping, uh, and all the so he owns all the responsibilities and authorities to manage the process from receiving the PO to the shipment. So it's a very different uh, organization structure with uh, many other Chinese companies in China. He has a lot of difficulties if I. If I started talking about this uh, subject, uh, I think I can talk one hour later. Well, go for it. We, st we still have uh, <laughs> 20 minutes. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> so there, there also, it's, it sounds like a very, the, from the, uh, the, the federation manager, uh, manager from the PO, received the PO to shipment. Sounds, uh, and it's horizontal value streams, he owns everything. It sounds like it's, uh, it's, very, it's a better way, right? But it, Minecraft has two sides. It also has a lot of challenges. Like uh, the various managers, he has to be uh, like a superman, understanding from the production, the engineering, the, uh, even how to, how to operate the SAP ERP system. So, so it's very difficult to, to develop a value stream managers. And also for like a comeback to the, we, the quality and engineering. If we split the quality engineering team to the different value streams, then for the engineering, if we did not centralize it, the knowledge in the engineering yes. team cannot no, absolutely that cannot be uh, stored and uh, getting developed. If if the the factory losing the engineering barriers, that's a bigger problem than the department's barriers. So that's the biggest challenges uh, uh, we are having now. And then now we are coming to have, uh, uh, how to say, uh, engineering head, metrics managing the engineering team. So we still have uh, engineering team as a department, but all the engineers work for different value streams, but they report to the value stream manager and also the engineering uh, chief engineers. So that's kind of, uh, when we are implementing the value stream organization structures to be very careful about the, the, this, there is uh, no there is no good compromise it's always a compromise right between the need for learning in a function specialty again and the need for the, the, for cross functional processes um, this is where i find that what we do is uh, obeyas are very useful because this is how we use management obey us because what we do, I mean, the CEO is asks every functional head to share with others what they're doing, the, the problems they're solving, the changes they're making. So we can coordinate all the functions in terms of what each other is doing. So I tend to, I tend to go with a functional organization, but in which we we talk a lot and as you say the in which we 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 solve problems together the the one thing i would add for janatas that that uh, there is hope is that as you say dario um when you connect even if you're not systematic but in the company when you connect high energy people on a, a topic that is important even if they're not senior and even if they're not at the right place things will happen it's, it's amazing. Energy goes towards energy and energy goes towards connecting people together. So like what we're doing now, if you connect high energy people across the world, I, every time it's very surprising because it doesn't look like it could change anything, but in fact it does. So we, we never stop believing that 
because we don't see the effect right away. But still, it works. That we, you need to find high energy people uh, and you connect them together. And even in the most rigid, high bound system, it it does something. It 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 moves things forward. Right, right. And I think the, uh, taking this uh, point of value stream manager that Ken mentioned, uh, it's very hard. It, it's it's going to be impossible to have a Superman, a person who knows everything across a value stream, the, all these specialties, right? But one of the skills, one of the most important skills that a value stream manager can have is problem solving skills. Because if he has it, he or she has it, that can can make these connections, can be an integrator. A value stream yeah, manager integrate. can be an integrator. It would be a, man, a value stream integrator more integrator. than a value stream manager. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, there's a, a question, interesting question. It's, uh, let's say, from Lean Roots. Uh, Ronaldo is asking, what's the best way, best way to implement Pokayoke? So as a requirement on the on the product, let's say, uh, man, product, develop product design. So how to implement it in the shop floor as a requirement from product design? I've, I've always failed on that. Uh, I remember switching off Pokayokis because in Western companies, when you get uh, engineers to do Pokayokis, they build so many safeties in the machines that you can't produce. A real poker case come from operators are very practical. Um, I I found I found to be honest personally I found poker okay the hardest thing to do in lean. You have to be the most knowledgeable about the details of the process, and and the smartest. So it's even harder than Karakuri, personally. What I've learned to do is to put a lot more counting in place, um, counting cycles in machines. So what we do, particularly now that uh, information is so cheap, we count cycles and we don't wait for something to go wrong. We know that after a certain number of cycles, it's dangerous because the tool is used. So we, we sh uh, set an alarm and we replace it before it's optimized to optimize the flow. But I, I, I really don't know how to an answer the Pokayoke. I've seen some great Pokayokes that come up, but they really come up by accident. And I have to say that me personally, I've never found a way to to get people all the way systematically to to build Pokayokes. I think it's we 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 no longer. I know that Pokayokes from engineering are crap. They're just over engineered. It's like it's like Ken's robot. You know, it's like please tell me what you want to do with this. But getting Pokayoke from shop floor people, um, it's I, wow, <laughs> I don't know how to do it. Well, would it be the case of Karakuri as a way of uh, incentivizing creativity, of engaging people from the shop floor for uh, what they know about the product, what they know about the process, and develop simple solutions? Like Karakuri is a simple solution, right? Easy, low yeah, cost. But 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 in the industry I, I don't most industry uh, we're we're now really beyond that um most processes have been solved to some extent do you see what i mean the the you know the simple pokayoke um there's still opportunity for this but they're not that many because many of these problems have been solved and usually the 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 quality issues that you see are are hard to detect uh, again, you have to go by touch, or you have to go with some machine, or you have to go with vision. Uh, that there, in my experience, the, the the technical processes I look at, there's nothing obvious. Uh, you have to be right. really smart about it. Yeah, right. And many things, uh, let's say, are being replaced by automation. So they put automation, and then make some uh, dimensional control, surface yep. control, everything else, right? And but one one point that I mentioned before, and I, I I had this experience with Ken Liu in China, was a over requirement, over specification from the design, and then very hard to do on the shop floor. Remember uh, Ken in one of the factories so uh, we worked with in Tianjin, and there was this issue, this situation of a lot of uh, over requirement from engineering. And at the end of the day, the shop floor guys were saying, hey, I, 
I can make it uh, at this at this point, but the process is not capable for reaching out to this uh, higher level standard. At the end of the day, the engineering, the engineers, okay, so I can approve that. Oh, this is a sort of situation. How can we really not 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 uh, not simply saying about pokayokis, but bringing the real experience and the real capability of a shop floor to meet uh, product design product requirements, right? Design requirements uh, um, and this, this can be also a sort of uh, alignment and pokayoki in terms of uh, product requirements and what is really needed from customers' perspective that the operators know, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. I um, have to say that talking to you guys makes me feel so much younger. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> because, I mean, we hardly have any industry left in France. And uh, a lot of my work now is uh, is with uh, IT systems, not not mechanical uh, systems. I love it. I love it to see that in Brazil and China, people are still making parts and with machines, and and it makes me feel twenty years younger. You know, I, I miss I miss yes yes, and you know <clears throat> you know that the, the the smell of injection presses at five o'clock in the morning. Ah, <coughs> I, I miss this. <laughs> and uh, most of my work now is um, is with uh, IT systems, and uh, it's very different. So I'm re I'm enjoying this. This is uh, this is very nostalgic moment. Great, I, great. I miss you know. Can do, do you see what I mean? Can I miss building yeah. real things? Yeah, the real things. Uh. You can feel calm when you are in the machines. Exactly, exactly. You know that this calm that comes because you, you can put your life. I used to be a sailing skipper. It was the same thing, you know. Your life goes away. Yeah, you're there in the shop floor, and it's just you and the people on the machines. And no, I, yes, it's a wonderful feeling. So I moved my office from the office building to the to the workshop. This is my office. It's in the workshop. I can see on your background. Yes, we can see it. People who, and still, what time is it now? Nine o'clock. Uh, uh, nine, nine, right? Nine p.m. It's nine shift. Nine p.m. Yes, yeah, so, nine shift. Very, very, very good. This is something that I learned. I learned in China. You probably, it would probably sound ridiculous to you, Ken, but uh, this is something I learned in China: is that the process wants to flow. People want to buy the product, mm -hmm. and people want to make the product, and the product wants to be made. And you have to understand who's the idiot, who's blocking it. Who, who's the purchasing manager who's asking for one cent more and creating trouble? Who's the, where's the machine that is not being specified is to do it? And, and so I've learned to look at the other way around, which is not try to build the best product ever. But when you see the size of, uh, it was a size of Chinese factories that made me realize that is that these things want to be made. You know, the product mm -hmm. wants to be made. And all you have to do, it's like um, acupuncture. All you have to do is figure out where the blockage is. And when you find out where the blockage is, and if you take that away, you know, the, you will be carried away by the flow. And, and, and yes, I, I, there is a calm on the shop floor about parts being made. And you know what to do because you look for blockages and you just work them out. And just, and I think it's... Um, it's a very exciting, uh, I, I, I miss that feeling. <laughs> with, with IT systems, it's the same. It's really the same, but it's much, much harder to, to, um, it's, to see. It's in, invisible, right? It's <laughs> invisible, and, and you never yeah. have that feeling of, of machines quietly working and producing parts and getting ahead. You know, you, you don't get that. <clears throat> yeah, we are. We are at 10, 10 p.m. now, I think 2 p.m. in France, 9 p.m. In, in China, as we promised to keep it alive one hour for in respect to, to who is following us. But I, I, would, I would like to say, as Ken, you, it's the first time you are. Uh, that's the second live I <coughs> do, right, Michael? Yeah. For yep. this open live, this uh, freestyle. And I must say one thing. Um, I, first time I landed in China in 2006, 14 years ago, one thing, uh, there is one uh, characteristic of the Chinese that
that's learning. So this is one characteristic very close to lean. Yeah, and this yeah. is learning so fast. So learning fast. so fast, and they in the eager to learn. So it's so impressive. And we can we there's a misconception uh, in all over the world about China. But who 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 understands who lives there as I did? I had this opportunity. We can we can see this. Uh, that's a very that's uh, inside the Chinese. It's uh, Chinese are humble. They're eager to learn, to apply, to develop better things. Uh, Ten years ago, there was no Chinese factories in Brazil. Now we well, have uh, five Chinese factories. Yes, and 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 can be stubborn as well. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. <laughs> not the young ones, not the the youngest ones like Ken, but the old I remember ones a few. I stuff. remember a few sessions in China with the Indians, you know. Like, oh, oh, oh. This is true. This is true. But uh, uh, but given that, I think Ken, these characteristics uh, of learning, of eager to learn, it's much higher than the Brazilians, for example. Uh, I, I can tell you, this is very impressive. And I think this is uh, what is really moving China forward to become, let's say, um, to apply lean, to, to make the companies, uh, the factories more uh, productive, better quality. I think you are one of these, the, the examples, right? Acme. Acme is an American company with factories in Brazil, China, and US, USA. And 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 China and and Ken Liu is a very young guy. I, I'm very proud to know you. For we work it together, and I know you are leading this company to to be uh, one of the best uh, lean Chinese companies, right? In, in, in China, uh, this is. I'm, I'm very proud. I'm very happy for for working with you, Ken, for for a okay. few years. Um, so, okay. uh, final words from you, Ken, and then Michael. Yeah, please. I learned from you two mentors, like uh, Matt Dario, 13 years ago, right? And then you saved my life. Without you, I will not sitting here. <laughs> One, <three. laughs> it's true, he saved my life. <laughs> not kidding. Oh, that's true, and, yes. I, we, had a, we have a very interesting uh, story to tell, very short. Ken, uh, Ken, was living, Ken, Ken is from the South, but he was living in Tianjin. Uh, and then one of the weekends, he went to climb up one mountain. Uh, in a little bit north of uh, Tianjin area, 400 kilometers. And then Monday morning, he, he didn't show up to work. And then we tried to, to reach him out. And then uh, Justin Tao, hey, I got a message here that Ken went for climbing and he's, he got lost. Man, I went to this mountain, 400 kilometers to, <laughs> to rescue this, <laughs> not to rescue, but to mobilize. It was two days rescuing. It's very, <laughs> that's a, another story, but very, very nice. Right? Very interesting. And also, back right. to 10 years ago, I met Michael in Shanghai. Yeah, I learned from the, the first book, Goldman 1, 2, 3, and I tried. It's in my blood, I can say. And uh, every daily work, I implement it uh, every day. Yeah, thank nice. you to Mentos, Sensei. Well, I don't, I, don't, I don't know about Sensei. I think, I think yeah. Um, Again, I think it's it's great to connect, I'm, and and it's great to be proud. I'm, I, I must say, Ken, I'm I'm so proud of having my uh, my books. Uh, I'm 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 pretty unknown here in France, you know, and um, having my books translated in China. Uh, I don't know if you guys realize, but half of my book sales are in China. Yeah, the the goal. I mean, in Brazil as well. It, it, you know, because of the size of China is incredible, so it's still a very small drop in China. Yes, yes, exactly. But a ha half of my book sales global is China, and so I'm, uh, and that's something I'm really very very proud of. And um, I also want to thank uh, Joe Lee. You know, there's a uh, Marcus always, but Joe also who who has been so such a fantastic. Um, a supporter and he's recently um managed to have a second edition of the gold mine in uh, in taiwan and a beautiful cover so i i i don't know about senseis and mentors i think we we all learn from each other and and what's in, in, important is what we do now is connecting the passion and keeping it alive locally but connecting across the world and i think I, I don't want to be. I don't want to sound preachy, but I think we need lean in the world right now. 
Right. Uh, China has the same problems we have. We have a massive sustainability problem. Massive. I think it's real. This is the third uh, consecutive years of warmer t temperatures. And I don't know of any other method that can keep this industrial method going and our lifestyles going and lower the burden. So I think we need lean. I think we need green lean. And I also think we're never going to be doing enough. But my, my intuition is that connecting across the world, as we do, and connecting the passions is the way to move things forward. So I'm really glad Thank to you. speak with you guys. I think it's incredible fun. <clears throat> uh, let's let Ken go home, because it must be terribly late there. <laughs> But yes. but uh, um, it's great to see you again, Ken. And I think it's um, it's uh, have a have a lovely evening. It's great to see you, Dario. Let's great let's to keep, you too, let's, let's let's continue. And just one final thing, uh, Ken Liu has just published uh, his first book, right? Ken, you you just wrote That's a book, cool. and um, Chinese, and I'm, I'm looking forward to to read it in yes. English, please. <laughs> Congratulations, Ken. Congratulations. Is, is that the is that the fourth gold mine? Uh, yeah, oh, the they, they, they name it uh, the fourth gold mine. They, they, oh, they I'm so it. honored. I'm so honored. I, this is so exciting. And I can't wait to read it. Now, now you must translate it into English. Yes. Yeah, I'm doing that. I'm doing that. Could be finishing, okay. uh, it's going to be months. quicker to translate into English than for me to learn to read the Chinese. <laughs> oh, definitely. Maybe in another <laughs> life. <laughs> All right. Guys, uh, congratulations, Ken. Uh, how does Thank it feel you. to be an author? Isn't it cool? Sorry? How does it feel to be a published author? Uh, it's hard to, hard to describe because I, I have no, no idea how does this book uh, will... How does the readers will like it or not? Maybe it's just say, uh, a few hundreds then. No. But you should like. Do you like it? How do you, I, th I, I, I still love it. You know, I've just signed a new publishing contract. Uh, no, I'm not even signed it. I've received a new publishing contract, and there's nothing that makes me feel more elegant <laughs> than than publishing contracts. Then they never. Then everything is downhill from there. You know, it's it's everything's a big disappointment. But I I, I love the I love the I love the seeing the book. So congratulations. Congratulations, Ken. Congratulations. Thank Beautiful. Thank guys. All right, guys. Very, very good. glad for having you today again. Oh, there's an echo. Nope. And let's uh, let's do it again in 2021, Jan January or February latest. And we meet again live here. Bye, Bye, -bye everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you for watching us. Bye. 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 Bye.